And I want to introduce our panel right now. So we have uh, Jennifer Polka, who's the executive director uh, and founder of Code for America. She's going to be moderating. And she's going to be joined by Julie Elberfeld, who is the CIO of the Commercial Bank for Capital One, Kimberly Bryant, the founder of Black Girls Code, Zasmin Montez de Oca, who is the executive director for Girls Who Code. And so we're, we think this is going to be a fantastic conversation, and I'm really excited to welcome them on stage. Thanks so much, Pat. Let me come out here and get settled. Oh, what a great audience. This is going to be a fantastic day. We're very lucky to be the first panel. Um, I feel very honored to be asked to moderate this. I feel like I am the woman who fell out of the STEM pipeline. <laughs> but um, Kat has done such a fabulous job and pulled together an amazing uh, panel of women here. And we are going to talk about um, some of the things I think that may surprise you about the STEM pipeline. It's not always... Um, what you perceive. Um, I want to set the stage a little bit here. Um, we, you know, I think that the, the title here is, is the STEM pipeline leaking? And if you look at the data, I think we can answer that pretty quickly and move on to what we should do about it. Mm -hmm. um, but looking just at um, Bay Area, big Bay Area employers here, uh, just a couple of statistics. Generally, this is a bit unscientific, looking through some of the reports that have come out in the past two years. Um, the big companies uh, like Google and Twitter and Facebook here are tending to have a 70-30 or a 60-40 male to female ratio overall. But when you look at the technical positions in those companies, the numbers are a little bit different. So you've got Pinterest and Apple at about 20 female, 80 male. Um, You've got Pandora, LinkedIn at 17 or 18 percent female technical employees, uh, and then some companies like Twitter hovering around 10 percent. So we're going to talk a little bit about why those numbers are where they are, and um, I want to start with some historical perspective on this, and we're going to move on to sort of a global perspective, um, and, and then and some, some perspectives from women in color. Uh, and to start, uh, now I know that um, Kat introduced our panel, but for a little bit more introduction, we're going to start here with Julie Eberfeld. Um, and the, what I would like to tell you about her is that she started as a COBOL programmer in 1987 uh, <laughs> and is now the Senior Vice President um, for Commercial Banking Technology at Capital One, which has 65 million customer accounts. So I'm thinking that's a pretty big job. Uh, so. We have to think about this progression from, you know, entry level COBOL 87 to now and what you're doing and that amazing career arc. But let's start with a little bit of what may surprise you about what it was like in 87. Yeah, I think, thank you. I'm so glad, glad to be here. And, um, you know, I am leading our Women in Technology Initiative at Capital One. And when I go out and speak, I talk about this notion that only 18% of computer science graduates today are women. And then I do what I'm going to do right now. What do you think it was in 1985 when I was in school? Just yell out what percentage you think it was in 1985. This may be a more informed audience, but anybody? Two, three, three. Two, three five, yeah, that's what I normally hear. So you'll be surprised to know then that it was 36%. Wow, yeah, that's what I get every time. And so I think that um, that's not what people expect. They think that, you know, opportunities are progressing and things are getting better, and in fact, they're not. They're, they, it has gone the opposite direction. And Julie, so in 1987, did people say to you, why are you entering this male-dominated field? Oh, absolutely not. In fact, it was encouraged. And when I think about the floor that I sat on at the time, you know, our entire tech team was all on one floor, it was definitely at least 50% women, maybe even more. I was in financial services, and it may have even been more women. Some of the really go-to women, the ones that were the experts on things that maybe you folks don't know today, but things like VSAM files, they were all women. The woman who created the best database that ran our processing system was a woman named Frida. I never met her, she'd already retired, but it was Frida and everybody knew Frida. Um, and so it was just a totally different experience and it was, 
it was just an extension of other things that people did well. If you were good at computation or you were good at math or good at science, it was just an alternative. It was never viewed as a, a man's job. So raise your hand in the room if you have somebody in your life. For me, it's my mother-in-law, who's 75, who was uh, programmed on punch cards at an insurance company. Do you know a woman like that who was part of sort of the, the early days of computers? Yeah. Do you consider them your role models? Do you consider them as part of the history of this? You could, and maybe that's a rhetorical question. Um, so if it was 36 and it's now 18, we have a problem. We do. We have a big problem. We do. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the global perspective. So Zazmin is the chief maker at Women Who Code, um, which if you don't know, actually we'll start with, who here is a member of Women Who Code? Right on, <laughs> excellent. So for those of you who aren't members, but you should be, um, uh, this is a global nonprofit. They are in 15 countries, uh, about 40 cities. They do weekly uh, study groups for women to up their skills. And you had a similar, let, let's start uh, with playing off of, of, of Julie's experience. You also, in this day and age, three years ago, had a different entry than what most people expect into the technical field. My experience was really positive. My first exposure to programming was at a Women Who Code event where everyone was extremely welcoming, ready to answer my questions, and there to help me get my development environment set up so that I can start programming with them. So, yeah, my role models immediately became women. Which is not what we typically think, and I heard so many women, even to me, and I'm not technical, say, mm -hmm. how do you manage in this male-dominated field? But there can be a very warm entry into this field. So briefly, since you have this perspective of 15 countries, mm -hmm. what does the environment look like compared to other countries around the world in terms of women in tech? Yeah, it's, it's definitely different depending on where you are in the world. Um, in places like Brazil, uh, tech is very much a community actually like the United States, um, and there's a lot of programming jobs, so um, there are a lot of very highly technical women who like, still feel similarly to how um, we feel even in San Francisco about wanting to, to grow a community to be with um, an, another welcoming environment. In places like Jamaica, there aren't as many women in tech. And um, their women who code events are a little bit more private. Uh, and they have to um, like, make sure that a member is is there for the purpose of the event and really there to program and to uh, be a part of this welcoming community because um, sometimes it's, it's not as safe for them and they've had to, to take steps back. Um, in places like Bangalore, there, there are a ton of women in tech, but they can only have events on the weekend because it's not too safe to have them in the evenings. So it, it varies, but the mission's the same and the passion's the same. People want to keep programming and they want to advance their technical skills and they want to do it in a community where they feel welcomed. And you're leading up an even further global expansion. Yes. That's exciting. Very we exciting. want to reach one million by 2019. That's amazing. That's amazing. So I want to ask each of the panelists, I'm going to start with you and then go to you, Kimberly. Um, tell a story about that illustrates on a personal level why women fall out of the pipeline, whether it's girls or young women? A, a general feeling is um, the feeling of belonging, where um, our members often say, like, I'm at a Women Who Code event and I feel like I belong. People are telling me I'm a great programmer. People are um, telling me that I'm asking great questions. And that's something that's not often found on the the day-to-day -day work life and it's those like micro um, like subtleties that make our members feel like maybe I don't belong um, and maybe this isn't the right career path for me. So um, it's the little things, mm -hmm. it's not hearing back encouragement, it's not, it's, it's feeling like the outsider. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, even comments as simple as bro or mm -hmm. hey guys or um, 
I, I can keep going, but <laughs> and we're gonna talk, when, we're, we're gonna, when we get back to Julie, we're going to talk a little bit more about how you can raise those issues. But let's go to Kimberly. Now you've got you you, you get to tell more than one story if you okay. want here. But I explain to me what you see when you've got girls in your program. So I, I, I Kat introduced uh, Kimberly, but once again, if you don't know Black Girls Code. Uh, an amazing nonprofit. Tell me again how many cities you're serving. You're in. Uh, um, we're in seven cities seven currently. Cities. Um, six in the U.S. and one in Johannesburg. Johannesburg, that's right. Over 2,000 girls yes. um, going through the program. So um, tell us what you see. What what what's one example of what? Um, you have this amazing program that's drawing women in, or drawing girls in and supporting them. What's pushing them away? Tell one example. I think um, one example that I, we, I shared when we were doing our speaker um, little debrief before the summit was about my own daughter who was really my motivation for starting Black Girls Code. And when, three years ago when she was in middle school, she had this interest, a really keen interest in gaming and doing a lot of gaming. And I wanted her to, to learn to code and be really productive with her use of, this, of the computer. But now, three years later, um, she's done lots of programming. She's done lot. She knows lots of different computer languages. So I would feel that she's not necessarily an entry level or a new programmer. And as we were going into high school and she was looking to go into AP computer science, um, when we went to the introductory meeting with the professor, he discouraged her from joining the class because like, oh, you're, you're only a freshman and you really should be an upperclassman before you can handle this class. And we were like, oh, no, you don't understand. Um, you don't really understand this, who this kid is. <laughs> In a nice way, though. And you don't know who you're messing with. <laughs> and I was like, no, she, she's been programming for three years, and she knows, like, multiple languages. Um, but he would not budge in terms of letting her get into this class when he'd also already told most of the parents that came to the open house that night that most of the students that come into the class have never programmed before. And they also just happen to be about 85 or 90% male. Um, so we took his advice and we went and ahead and went in the introductory level programming class that he said we should do before. And she, she aced it, she, she received an A. So we went back to this open house um, that for this year, just a few weeks ago, it's was like, oh, you know, we did what you said and get in, went into this other class. And she has an A, so we will be signing up for APCS in the fall. <laughs> so he's like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but I think the, the, the thing about that experience is that I had a little bit of background and I knew um, what path I was trying to direct my daughter on. Most parents don't have that type of background, and especially if you're talking about parents from underrepresented communities, um, Hispanic families, African American families, they just don't know. And so the teachers are, are actually gatekeepers um, at a very early age for girls. So that was my experience, but I've heard similar experiences from young women that are in college now or that's graduated from college and how many of their teachers along the path discourage them from going into a direct computer science um, career pipeline. And that's one of the things I think that often um, it stops women before they even get started. Before they even get started. Yeah. Now, you have a 20-year career in, mm -hmm. in technology. You've been at um, major companies like Genentech and Merck and Pfizer, um, and you're doing Black Girls Code full-time now. Mm -hmm. But anything to share, especially on the front of um, not just being a woman, but a woman of color. So mm -hmm. um, there was a study done by University of California at Hastings um, that showed that 93% of, of white women experienced some sort of bias, and 100% of women of color who answered their survey felt that they had, expe had experienced gender bias. Oh, yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I think um, similar to the, the incident in, in schools, I think one of the things as a woman of color that we have to contend with is this whole notion of intersectionality. Uh, so not only are we entering a workforce that doesn't have very um, much gender diversity, it also doesn't have very much racial diversity. So I'm often, uh, we, we often find ourselves confronting multiple issues at one time. Um, I think for most of my career I was, um, probably one of a handful of that, of women of color that were in the engineering departments of most of the major companies that I was employed with. 
And it was difficult because there weren't a lot of role models. There were a handful, a handful of role models. And so being able to navigate and really find allies was often not as easy as it, it probably could have been to navigate a career, especially in a difficult path like um, engineering. Did you ever consider changing careers? No. I never <laughs> considered changing careers because I'm just too stubborn for that. <laughs> and I, um, I, I think hands down, I often think that, you know, for me to even that, even to get through engineering school, because there, I was an electrical engineer, and there was really no women in our electrical engineering degrees mm -hmm. at, when I started, and that was in '85 when there was a peak of women in engineering, but not too many of us going into double E. And I think that having that grit um, and really having that attitude that I was gonna make it no matter what was key to me being able to navigate. So I think when I see um, the, like the promotion that Cheryl did with Van Bossy and how important the studies on how important grit is, that's very true, but I also think we shouldn't necessarily have to have this level of grit to survive. So I think the foundations and the structure must change, but we also you know, should develop this grit and persistence so that we can stay the path once we get in. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you for your grit yeah. and persistence. So Julie, what about you? Well, you have a story of why women drop out. You've seen, you've been mentoring women at Capital One for years now. What yeah. do you see? The, what, what, again, first, what pushes them away? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, as an executive at our organization, when I heard this 56% statistic of women dropping out, I mean, it's just it's scary. It's an economically scary kind of concept yeah. that you've trained women. They're at the kind of height of their career where they're going to be your future leaders and start to mentor other people, and they're dropping out at a rate of 56%. I mean, that's just astonishing and scary. And so I really started to think about it and talk to women and um, talk to women who have left the field. And the, the common thread, I think, is not necessarily one thing. It's not like, oh, you know, I just had this experience and then I just had to get out. It's never anything like that. It's always a series of things and almost something they themselves can hardly identify. Mm -hmm. And I have to kind of pull it out of them. Did you experience this? Did, was this a factor? And I think what I find is that a lot of times it has to do with the fact that women have one, a broad set of interests. They tend to align themselves as much with the business that they support as they do with their technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are then frequently asked by someone in the business to join the business side of things. And they, when they're asked, someone acknowledged their skill, someone showed that they were valued, appreciated them. I just talked to a woman recently who said that she had um, been in tech and she thought she was doing well and she enjoyed her career and she wasn't really contemplating a change um, and someone in the business offered her a promotion and not a promotion in a year but a promotion right now to an executive level job and so that when she said she reflected on it the fact that someone expressed value and saw the value of what she had to give to the organization was what made the difference even though she loved her job in tech, she didn't see a clear path to that level job, and the business just gave her that opportunity, like now. Mm -hmm. And it's that value statement, it's I feel valued, mm -hmm. um, that I think is, is something that we don't do enough of um, for women in tech, and our business partners in, in financial services certainly tend to do that for, for our women. Yeah, and so that's for women who've come in, they're in Capital One, um, and this, we can open this up to both of you as well, but we're not seeing as many women go in, take, you know, taking computer sciences in, in, as a major, we're not seeing as many women just wanting to do this job in the early, you know, the early parts of the pipeline. And you mentioned that you know, when, when you started in this career, and I think probably you too, Kimberly, it was less of a, this is a male-dominated job. What's happened? Where, how did we lose the narrative, and how did this become the thing where if you say you're going to have a career in tech, everyone goes, oh, good luck, you're going to be surrounded by men all the time. What happened there? Certainly a very complex question. I know there's lots of people trying to answer that question. I mean, there's, you know, from the, the 
personal computer tends to be somewhat aligned with the, the trend in the backwards direction for women. The marketing was very male dominated. It was very much viewed as a, a tool for men. If you go back and look at a lot of the marketing, it was all about boys and, boys and men in the marketing. Um, so that certainly was a factor. I also think there was um, just the industry in general went through a change sort of in the early 2000s where we you know, started to um, do a lot of offshoring of jobs and the media around the offshoring of jobs get left the impression that there were no jobs going to be left in the United States, which just wasn't true, but that was the media sort of hype around it. And so I think we lost a lot of people out of the field then. And then when you combine, we lost a lot of people out of the field and now we try to bring them back and the role models that people have are, you know, the founders of some of these big tech companies that are men, you combine those two things together. And I, I think those are, are some of the factors. Did you see this too, Kimberly? Absolutely, I, I think, you know, I know when I graduated, that was at the beginning of the whole personal computer, um, the boom pretty mm -hmm. much, and the industry really changed a lot and it became a different industry. So I think at that time, some of the companies that were um, the major players, it really shifted quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I think the environment and the community for the tech ecosystem changed at that same time. And so women went, you, if you look at the charts, you'll see that women have increased in the other hard STEM fields. So mm -hmm. in chemistry and mechanical engineering, all of those trend up, but computer science is like falls off a virtual cliff. Yeah. And that, that is what I see that was happening around that time at the end of the 80s, is that we were going in this new direction in the tech industry and all those things, I agree, you know, like a spot on that started to happen and really women didn't see themselves as really having a seat at that table. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I know I hear all the time that we're, women, who are engaged, women and men who are engaged in activities designed to diversify the tech industry or doing it for their kids. They're doing it for you know, daughters, nieces, sometimes nephews too, you know, or, or sons and nephews where they, you know, they want them to work in an environment that's gonna reflect their values. Um, and uh, I, I, I you know personally many people who've said, you know, this, this is, just pains me <laughs> to think that this environment that my, my kid would, I want my kid to have the same opportunities. It's not that all, all girls are gonna go into tech. Um, but there's other reasons that we do this work. There are business reasons we do this work. Um, maybe you, you can start and then uh, we'll go to Zasman and then Julie, you can you know, end on sort of a Capital One's view on this. But if you, you know, what are the business reasons we should have a diverse workforce? Well, you know, I, I, I'm one that you know, speaks a lot about my motivation being uh, really because of my daughter and her interests. And I think that's a very real and valid um, reason for folks to want to change it. But it's not really a philanthropic endeavor for companies. It's a business imperative. So if you look at the early adopters of, of all technology, from devices um, to applications on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, mostly women. So we're the ones that are driving the conversations on Twitter. We're the ones that are really into Pinterest. We are the ones that are buying devices and making the purchasing decisions in our households. So it's important for businesses to reflect that in terms of their departments that are creating these tools, that are the, creating these applications. Because we're looking, if we're looking through a lens that's singular and it's only from the male gaze, that's the best way I can, I can put it, then how are we really reflecting what we as consumers that are women that are driving these purchases of want? What do we want to see? You know, what's being missed in the marketing if we're not including women in the design, creation, and build of these products? So I think for businesses to truly be able to tap into their market and really be able to meet the needs, they have to include more women. It's imperative that they really want their businesses to continue to grow. So that's one of the things I, I think is a, a true proven business reason for companies to really diversify the workforce. And you've got tons of companies coming to Women Who Code saying, this is my pipeline, why are they coming? Mm -hmm. They need to hire more people. They need software engineers on top of everything that Kimberly mentioned. Um, there aren't enough uh, people to fill the jobs required in the global job market. And we need more software engineers in general. And if it continues to not be a diverse industry, then it'll never be filled. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think you just can't, you, the number, the math just doesn't work. Right. I mean, when you look at how many jobs are forecasted to be out there in the next five years in technology, mm -hmm. and you say the pipeline is going to stay the way it is, the jobs can't be filled at all with the, with the, the current pipeline, men or women. And so if you don't bring a more diverse workforce to the table, uh, you know, you're just not going to fill the jobs. So it's a really economic issue. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the funny, my, when I first started supporting the Women in Tech Initiative at Capital One, I came home, my husband said, well, you know, I don't mean to play devil's advocate, but why does it matter whether or not we have women in? And I think he was asking a genuine question. He's extremely supportive of me and, and um, he's also in tech. And so, but he, he really wanted to know why it mattered. And I said, you know, look, it, 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 it's about reflecting the customer base and the communities in which we work. Um, it, it's well beyond a social issue. Um, and, and, and I think there are just tons of data, there's tons of data that shows that groups, more diverse groups, produce better results. Um, and, and I don't know if anybody saw the, the media articles that came out a couple weeks ago, but there was, there's been a lot of data that shows that, you know, if you take two groups of, of an all-male group and then a, a diverse group, even if the collective IQ of one group okay. is higher than the diverse group, the diverse group will perform better on an IQ test if they're, you know, similar, but, but yet maybe collectively a lower IQ. Somebody but, should find that and tweet it out with the hashtag. Let's yeah. get that yeah. circulating. But the, <laughs> but the interesting thing is why. And so there was a recent research um, published by, I think it was MIT, Carnegie Mellon, and Union College about that there was this concept of average social sensitivity and that women have more social sensitivity. And I think that, again, why do women perhaps create better end products? They have more empathy for their end user. They have more social sensitivity. And so that is what they believe was, is the nut behind why diverse groups with women perform better, which I thought was just fascinating. But we need women. They, they are important to reflect our customers and the communities in which we work. And we certainly are trying to do our part in Capital One for that. It's interesting just to make an observation. I mean, the um, qualities that are generalized about women um, that you mentioned are also pulling them into the business, you know, and, and out of technical. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Kimberly, you mentioned, uh, you know, or somebody mentioned, Cheryl Sandberg. We've just created these sort of archetypes, and I and I, you know, huge respect for Cheryl. But if you think about the way that sort of played out, it's like, well, Zuck has his thing, and mm -hmm. Cheryl has her thing. And, um, and, and, and I aspire to be more like Cheryl as well, but you know, it's, it's hard then for a woman to aspire to be the Zuck character. And I want to call out my um, former colleague, Vivian Grobard, um, who works in uh, the White House, who um, did a great job of, of a very subtle and, and gentle correction when um, somebody had tweeted out that uh, a former colleague of ours um, was the Sheryl Sandberg of the United States Digital Service. And she said, no, she's the Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> she founded it. And um, I think it's, I have uh, nothing but respect and affection for the person who, you know, made our friend Haley into the Sheryl. And I think that's a wonderful comparison to make. But I think it's also just, it's the channels that are, that are grooved, right? That we say, oh, she would, be the, she would be the Sarah. She's the founder, let's give her credit. And um, that these things do play into our conscience. Yes, I think one of the things that's been resonating with me um, lately is um, Cheryl's a big, I, I'm a big fan of Cheryl Sandberg as well, but I'm also a big fan of Marissa Meyer because she is an engineer. So as any engineer techie will tell you, like if you see a woman that's technical and, and she's doing like similar things to Mark, that's like, you know, really makes us excited. And, but it, it pains me to see like some of the, the press that she gets. And I don't see many things that are really different when I see the press than things I've heard about many of her male peers that are also leading companies and, mm -hmm. and have these idiosyncrasies and these ways that they lead. But women are often not given that same latitude, you know, to bring their whole entire selves, flaws, and, and, and both their strengths to the table as leaders. And I think that's one thing that we need to change in the industry because we don't, I mean, we, we kind of have an, un, not many of us can aspire to be a, as great as Sheryl Sandberg. No, and everybody should have to be. We should just have to be great at what you're bringing to the table in that role. So that includes your strengths, that includes the flaws. I want to see 
the full um, concept of a leader that then steps into that place. And I want to see women be able to have, you know, the latitude to both make mistakes and both have successes. And I think that's one thing that as we're pushing women to take on these leadership roles in tech, we're going to have to be very conscious of and, and not hold our female leaders up to an unrealistic standard that we don't do with our male. We're human. Yes. <laughs> we and are. we're best when we're human. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just Absolutely. to address a little something about uh, the skills and various talents that we have as, as people, all those skills are needed in the tech industry. If you yeah. can lead a team, that's great because you can lead a technical project and you can see it through uh, end to end. If um, you love arranging different possible scenarios, then that means you might not miss as many details for um, whatever feature you're trying to implement or uh, architect. And as a result, it might be uh, of much better quality from the start than, than it would have been had you not been a part of that technical job. So a lot of the skills that are needed in business or usually associated with business are skills that are also extremely important to the development process because coding is the last part that you do. Absolutely. So Julie, let's talk a little bit about um, what you're doing at Capital One. And I think that what we want to move into, we know there's a problem, but there are solutions. And people are doing things. And all of you are going to leave here today um, committed to doing something. So let's hear about, about the program at Capital One. What have you decided to do, and why are you doing those things? Sure. Um, happy to talk about this. Um, I, this, we have a program called Women in Technology or Women in Tech, um, and it's actually only a seven-month-old program, uh, and it's not a network. We have a women's network across our company. We've had for a number of years, and um, in each of our regions, we have women across all disciplines, but we, we felt like the tech space had a, a special opportunity. Um, I credit some of the women who are actually in the audience today from Capital One with really kind of putting some energy behind this, and, um, you know, I think... As executives, you sort of get, you know, internal focus and you're doing your work and you don't realize what's going on in the broader ecosystem and all of a sudden somebody, you know, puts these stats in front of you that says, do you know only 18% of computer science graduates are women and 56% of mid-career mid women are dropping out and you're like, oh, this could be a real problem for us. And so both as a large organization who feels like we can just give back to the community as well as an organization who feels as if we have the same risk as other companies in terms of this pipeline issue, um, we needed to do something. So we set up this program. Um, we have about probably 30 different things going on at one time. Um, we have a large, a large number of women that we can draw on to to participate, and men, by the way. It's very important. We have a little plus sign between the O and the M in our logo so that we're sure that we you know, draw the men into it because it doesn't do us much good to sit around as women and talk about it. Um, so we are addressing the whole spectrum of the career. So we're doing what we can for the pipeline program. So we're supporting things like Black Girls Code and other public organizations that are doing things. We have our own coders program where we're going into middle schools and training um, young children how to code. Some of those are, it's, that's um, boys and girls, but we have some all-girls schools that we're focused on to try to help with the girls' side of it. Um, so that's the pipeline side, and then we're focused on college campuses. How do we get out on college campuses? How do we take our great women out to college campuses and create role models and talk about what, you know, our culture and how great it is to work at Capital One, and how do we, you know, kind of uh, encourage the those 18% of women to come work at Capital One. Um, and, um, and then we're doing things internally as well. We um, are just forming a new course specifically for our tech folks on microaggressions. I think... Can you define microaggression for us? Absolutely. Um, those little things that people do that they don't realize they do. You were referring to a little bit, Zasmin. Um, you know, the, there's a group of women, in, uh, a group in a room. You're having a conversation about a particular business problem. Maybe there's only one software engineer in the room that's a woman. And suddenly the conversation goes technical and the eye contact moves away from the woman into the man, men, right? Just little things that start to happen and that people don't realize. Um, I personally didn't have a great awareness of this. I think awareness is so important. I think most men don't intend to do these things. They're just simply not aware. So we're trying to create a lot of awareness around the data, around the behaviors, um, and just ensure that our folks are aware of that. We're creating all kinds of programming around helping women in their careers, 
Um, Julie, can you talk a little bit about how the men are reacting to being made aware of things like eye contact? I mean, I, I see this a lot. Yeah. Eye contact is such a small thing, but it yeah. really says a lot. So when you run them through this course, how do they react? We haven't done the coursework yet, but I mean, okay. I'm out speaking about it quite a bit. And so um, I have been so encouraged. In fact, I was sharing a conversation um, that I got a little teary-eyed, as we women do sometimes, um, when I got <laughs> all, an email. All of us do. <laughs> yes, and then. Um, when I got an email from a, from a gentleman in our organization after I had given a talk about, you know, the, the opportunity and the microaggressions, and, and I got this just genuine, just awesome email from a gentleman who said, I really had no idea. And so I went and talked to the women in my organization about, was this happening? Does, do they see this? And although it wasn't a problem, he said, yeah, you know, they could identify these things occasionally that it happened. And, and he said, I'm so glad that you're bringing this awareness. And by the way, are there some of these great women organizations that I could make donations to? <laughs> I'm like, yay, <laughs> we're making a difference. And so men are reacting so positively. It is just phenomenal because they, they value the women in their organization mm -hmm. and they don't want to do anything that's going to create this likelihood that they would drop out. They're mm -hmm. developing women, you know, in their, in their teams and they want to keep them. I want to ask Zazman and uh, Kimberly, um, with the women and the girls in your program, how do you teach them or help them deal with things like, wait, suddenly they're not looking at me, they're looking elsewhere. <laughs> we were just having a conversation. Do, do you give them coaching around that? Um, we do give them coaching around that, but more on in an informal basis in mm -hmm. terms of the mentors that are coming into the program are women that are already in, in industry and we're really teaching them how to be leaders and teaching them how mm -hmm. to work in teams. So that coaching happens sometimes organically mm -hmm. in the course of what we're doing in, within the, the realm of the program. So we often find that when our girls go back out into um, the broader world where they're in a co-ed environment, they, they don't necessarily navigate the same. So okay. a, a good example is that um, we, we started doing hackathons last year and we sent our girls to another organization had a youth focused hackathon, but it was co-ed, but we took groups of girls. So some of our groups were girls only. Some of them had I know, other students from other organizations that have to be boys on the mm -hmm. team. These girls, I had to really make them be a little less assertive in this team with the one team with them that had two boys <laughs> because they were like, oh no, he doesn't, uh, they don't understand how to code like we do and they really took over this <laughs> team. And so we found ourselves really having right. to coach them that, you know, yes, you know, please include them in the conversation or please give them some tasks to do. Um, but I think that goes to like, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I kid you not, we really had to coach them. And the, the thing I think that changed is that we really, we really focused so much on that confidence building and, and that self-concept within the program, that, and that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Because we know we're not going to see the ratio change immediately. There's gonna be a long-term process, long process before we really get to parity uh, what, for them in college or even the workforce but we want them to be able to, to advocate for themselves when they're in, in co-ed environments. So I think the coaching that we do and giving them those skills to really be able to um, be more assertive and really have their eye, be able to speak up and advocate for their ideas and their thoughts, that's one thing that works for us. And, so, and so, we see. so you girls, they are looking at your girls. Yeah. Eye contact is right there, they're oh, demanding yeah. it. Yeah, That's awesome. <laughs> What about you, Zazen? Uh, there's a part of it that happens organically and a part that we do very strategically. So the more strategic aspect is um, when we see that someone has regularly attended an event and um, they, they're very good at this topic um, and we tell them, hey, like, and it's usually the leaders in the room who um, make it a point to, to really uh, notice who... Um, who's been coming regularly and who, who like what next step they can take. Mm -hmm. We um, encourage them to give a talk next time. And they might be terrified to, to give a talk because it might be the first place where they give a talk. But they give an amazing talk. And then they feel comfortable giving that same talk at work. And um, that practice of just speaking out loud and feel, feeling very comfortable talking about um, what you're good at 
um, and how to do it is extremely powerful. Yeah. So that's, that's more of the strategic approach. The, the organic approach is, is um, people go to, to the study groups on a weekly basis because they love to program, um, but especially because people in that room are people they call friends. Those are people they try to hang out with as much as possible. And um, often, a simple question will be asked, like, how are you? And maybe they had a bad day at work, and um, they're like, oh, well, you know, this happened, but I don't know if it's just me being crazy or, um, or if this is actually a problem. And that's when someone else will say, no, actually, th this is something that's worth bringing up at work. This is something that's worth mentioning. Um, and then they'll come back the next week and say, okay, I talked about it, I feel better now, it's resolved. And, and that's yeah. important, and it's, it's important because um, that person feels that way, but to have that reassurance of, okay, someone else thinks that this is also not okay is uh, extremely fundamental. And that's, that's something I rely on a lot, which is why I love being at Women Who Code. Everyone want to go to a Women Who Code event now? I do, <laughs> it's, it's pretty awesome. So I want to talk, um, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure we really hit on what, you know, we started out talking about what's pushing women away. Um, you just heard, I think, a very powerful example of what's pulling women in and keeping them. And that's at the personal level, and I think that so much of that, it's the network, it's the support, and as you started out talking about the feeling of, yes, I do belong here, whether you have to assert that or it's really, you know, um, um, encouraged and, and echoed around you. Um, but as we've talked about earlier, this is a personal problem, it's an institutional problem, it's an economic problem, it's a national problem, and I know we're talking about policy later on, it's a global problem. So let's, let's spend the next couple of minutes just on, you know, at the personal level, what works, and then at the institutional and higher levels, what is gonna work to fix this problem? What do we need to be focused on if we're committed to moving that number? You wanna, you wanna start, Kimberly? Sure, I, I think one of the things that I, I focus on a lot is K through 12, so I think one of the things that I'm really concerned about is making sure that we continue to feed the funnel uh, for girls that are entering um, careers in computer science. So we were looking at, uh, with some colleagues the other day, like the reports from 2013 of bachelor's degrees in computer science, and the numbers for women, it, we, we say it's like 18% for women overall, and for women of color, it's only 3%. But when we talk about the issue of not enough computer science graduates overall, if you really crunch those numbers, it's like hundreds, or, or let's just say thousands. So for women of color that graduated with a degree in computer science, bachelor's degrees in computer science in 2013, the number was about 1,500. Um, the women uh, for total. Total, 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 total graduates. People. For Latinas, that number is like 694, like less than 700. And so these numbers are compared to when we're saying consistently, oh, by 2020, we're going to have 1.4 million STEM-related jobs. So let's do the math. We are not, you know, so I don't think anyone can quarrel with the fact we need to really feed this pipeline with more women and more girls very early in the process. So I think some of the efforts, um, Code.org has done a great job of really pushing this issue of having computer science as a science uh, in the science pipeline in schools. But we really need to start teaching computer science as early as possible. So I really advocate for teaching computer science to all kids starting in elementary school. It's important that they have this access. And not only do they have it as individual classes, but really integrating computer science into all the other disciplines. Because that's how the world works. So you're not gonna go work at Capital One and not deal with technology. It's not gonna happen. You're not gonna go work in the world of entertainment or Paramount or Disney and not deal with technology. It's in the arts, it's in the math, it's in science, it's in biotech. Yeah. So we need to stop um, making it a silo because it, is, because it is not. Kids need to be really utilizing technology as a tool, and that's all kids, all through K through 12. And I think once they um, get past K through 12, we really need to look at how we enter uh, women, many of you that may be college students, how we are changing the programs and institutions, college institutions that are more amenable to really creating an environment which keeps girls there once they start. 
I think the only college that's really, well, it's maybe not the only college, but one that we all know that's really done great strides in that, in that matter is Harvey Mudd. Um, but looking at replicating that model at other institutions so that women don't start down the pipeline and then fall out after freshman year. Because the numbers, if you look at that, are about the same. Over half or maybe even 70% of women that start as freshmen in computer science, they drop out. 70%. Yes. So we need to address that by looking at how we're bringing new computer scientists into the field and modifying how, we, um, how we're doing that from a structural standpoint in the institutions once they start. So we're running out of time, but quickly, what works most? What do we need to be most focused on? I totally agree with Kimberly's perspective yep. on the pipeline. You've got to do something about the pipeline. It has to start young, and, and it has to be national. It can't be, you know, I think organizations like ours are trying to do something. We're doing what we can, but we've got to, it's got to scale. It's got to scale. Um, but I think that the one thing that I would say is that um, this is, we're in it for the long haul. I think we need to demystify that not every single company and not every single scenario is what is sort of portrayed in the media. I think there are some right. really great cultures and really great places to work. I happen to believe Capital One is one of those, and, um, and I think that's part of it. We have to tell the other side of the story mm -hmm. of there are really great women in technology who are doing really great things, and it can be a really, really phenomenal career. So you gotta, that, that image just needs yes. to change. Yes, you and have to change you, the image. We can't keep... Um, persisting this notion that this is the kind of person that does this. That's right. Mm -hmm. Zazman? Yeah, um, that's a big part of it. We want to make sure that people stay in tech, whether they decide to take a break, even if it is for a few years, they, they come back to it. Back. Um, and they're comfortable with that, whether they realize they, they want um, some sort of work-life balance that doesn't require them to, to have a full-time uh, engineering job that they can they can still do it and excel at it um, and we we provide a lot of those study groups so that you're continuously learning um, and and to bringing a positive perspective to the work environment um, you get to learn what a lot of tech companies are like through the different study groups because you're always visiting a new company and you start to lose sight of a lot of the negativity that's around the tech world because all you think is these are great places to work. I want to work here. Um, I want to sit at that desk and like grab that uh, drink and hang out with those people and I want to solve amazing problems here. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to echo that. Uh, solving amazing problems. Um, Code for America, where, where I work, um, and by the way, we don't teach kids to code, we work with local governments, but we have a, about half of our class of fellows every year is, is women, and I, you know, what they say is they want to do it because they're solving amazing problems. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an, an, a wonderful way to, uh, to attract women to any, yeah. any technical endeavor, is tell them this matters, this <laughs> really matters to people, what you're going to do. Okay, so we've got three minutes left, so you guys each have a minute, but I want to, well, it's going to be a little less than that because I'm going to set this up a little. We just talked about scale, the scale of the solutions that are out there that I think we can say are working, but the scale of the problem, and they don't match. So we're going to have to take um, what's working and blow it up 100 times, uh, you know, 100 times bigger than it is right now. And I think the thing that I have seen over the past several years is that, A, nobody is going to do this for you. You have three amazing role models and, and who should be inspiring you hugely right now but that you should not be thinking, oh, fantastic, I'm glad that these lovely ladies are on this problem. Good, it's all done. <laughs> the thing is that the way this is going to scale is through all of us in the room and all of the other people that we can reach. And so I'd like to ask each of you to wrap this up by giving some direction to the folks in the room about what their next steps should be. And why don't we start with you, Zazman, and we'll end with Kimberly. Well, given that we're in so many cities and we have a ton of people to connect, one million, I want to make sure that each of you know if a Women Who Code event is in your city, and if it's not, to consider starting a Women Who Code uh, network in your city. Um, you takers? Excellent. <laughs> I'm Great for that. We're, we're a sponsor of Women Who Code. We're going to be starting a chapter in Philadelphia here soon, so we're excited yes, about that. Anyone's in Philadelphia. Anybody in Philadelphia. Love to chat. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I think my, it, my ask is exactly the same, is be part of the solution. Um, it's going to take us all. Start the conversation in your organization. 
um, started in a really positive way. I think the, the staying positive and, and, and really demonstrating that everybody wants to be part of the solution. It's a, it's a real economic issue for your company, for, for our country. Um, and, and just get out there and talk to people. Talk to your nieces, talk to your you know, daughters, talk to your companies, talk to other women who could you know, join this field even if they're not there today. Just be out there talking about it. The more conversation we have, the more likely we are to solve the problem. Can we do a quick um, raise hands? Anybody here work in a company that has an initiative like Capital, in some way like Capital Ones? Couple hands. Great, okay. but a lot of hands that aren't up. Right. So, so, <laughs> so there's a lot of hands that aren't up that we would like to have. That we want them as the hands to be up next year when we get together again. Right. That's right. Um, for me, similar to Women Who Code, we have a goal of reaching a million girls but a little bit further in 2040, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. So we need mentors, we need other um, corporate sponsors to help us to really expand the efforts that we're doing. I'm thankful for um, Capital One support this year and opening, being able to open up a new chapter in Washington, D.C., but we're also looking to go to Boston. We're looking to do more things in Minneapolis. Dallas, Seattle. So we're really hoping to expand our efforts and I would love to have, you know, we really survive on women mentors in our program. So if you're in college or you're working at a company, please reach out, sign up on our website, volunteer to mentor, and then um, open opportunities if you're at a company for us to come in and work with you, bring our girls there, etc. Awesome. Okay, so it's very clear. Now I have messed up as a moderator for forgetting to do Q&A. So let's open it up. And how are we getting questions? <laughs> Just raise hands. Apologies, I get so into you guys. <laughs> it was perfect timing. <laughs> All right, great. We've got a question up front here. Is that for Julie and Kimberly? Um, I, I have to say that I can't feel it materially different. I think that's why it's so subtle, right? It doesn't feel materially different to me. I think that that's why I sort of, it kind of went by me. I had to have somebody sort of throw it in my face like something has changed. And then once that conversation started, I was like, oh yeah, it as, is actually a little different. There are less women in the room than there were when, when I was working previously. And so I think based on what I understand from the general, me, you know, the general things that I see in the media, Definitely there are differences in some organizations. I don't personally feel a tremendous difference in the overall culture, although I will say that it's, it only makes sense that if you have an environment that is you know, only 10% women or 20% women in some of these organizations, you're just gonna kind of have a male culture, right? I mean, it just sort of prevails. And so if you just change the mix, you're gonna get a little bit more normalized culture, I think. And just to repeat the question, it was, you know, what's changed since it began that, that's really um, to the culture? Do you, you want to quickly add no, on to that? I don't, okay. I don't All right, we've got a hand, hand up in the back here. What, uh, yes, we'll get the mic over there. Hi. Um, I'm wondering how women who don't code or don't have technical skills can but who, who work in tech and want to work in tech in another capacity can. Um, so women who are not technical as allies. Anyone want to take that? that sure, answer? that's that's a great question. Honestly, it's the first time I've I've heard it. So thank you for asking. And um, I, it definitely depends if you want to grow your team and bring more people on your team. Definitely um, be a part of um, that environment because that's. Like you saying, hey, I, I want you to be a part of my team is going to, to grow that environment um, to a much larger scale. I think you can be a role model for not every job in technology is a programming job. And I think that's yeah. a little bit of a misnomer sometimes mm -hmm. that, that the only way you can work in tech is to be a software engineer. I personally think it's a great background to have been mm -hmm. a software engineer, but there are a lot of non-technical jobs. And so just mm -hmm. be an advocate for those folks who have the sort of 
characteristics that work in tech that you know that, that you bring to the table and, and encourage them to be part of it. Um, I, I would also add real quickly that you know, marketing and when we're looking at the concept of product development and the total product life cycle, there's a lot more, I think as I said earlier, the coding is like the last thing that you do. So we really want, especially young girls that are looking at the tech field to see all the different pieces that go into creating a product. So that marketing element and that marketing background that you have is like so important. So being able to work with girls and mentor them through that and the, diff the different aspects of how marketing impacts product development is definitely something you, you can add. We're going to take one more quick question because I went a little over time and it looks like the mic is right there. So we'll take that one. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Monica Fayoumohit and I am with iBiology in San Puerto Rico. My question is, is it time to rethink this analogy about the pipeline? You know, a pipeline is, it goes, if you think about a pipe water going through a pipe, it goes one way, there's only one way in, there's only one way out, and if you leak out, you can't get back in. Um, and, and also, if you think about water, it's, it's homogeneous, you know, it doesn't take into account people that come from diverse backgrounds, walks of life, that start in one field and they want to jump into technology. Is it time for us to rethink this analogy of the pipeline so that we can make the field more inclusive? I think that's an yeah. excellent it's question. an excellent question. <laughs> Do you have a recommendation yeah. on what we should call it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about this for a long, yeah. long time. <laughs> And I don't have a good analogy, but I do think it's time to reframe mm -hmm. how we think about how people enter or exit the field. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll add something to that. I don't know if Sarah Allen is here, but she was a Presidential Innovation Fellow uh, and has done a lot with uh, as founder of RailsBridge. And she really makes the point that so often um, there are tech jobs for women that do not really require a serious engineering background that you know sometimes CSS is more like writing than it is like math and that not only is that knowledge flawed but some of the messaging around well if you're not good at math you're not going to be good at computers isn't really fair and and drives a lot of women away from the field mm -hmm. so I think it's probably more as a great question I think it's probably more than just that analogy that we ought to rethink does anyone want to add to that yeah I I know I definitely don't necessarily think of it in terms of the pipeline, and, and it's more so what you're explaining in that it's, it's very different. Um, I started uh, getting into software engineering later in my career, and um, in growing up in a Latino background, I didn't have role models like that were engineers, and um, that was not something that even occurred to me as a, an option for my career. So it's, it's happening, and that's super exciting. Thanks for ending on that great question. I feel like we should be starting there in some ways, but um, what a fantastic conversation. Thank you all very much. You're welcome. And um, we'll see you. Thank you. Thanks.